Very happy to be at least virtually in Southern California. And uh, I'd like to share my screen and write. Um, just for those of you who haven't been uh, recently to UCSF, this is the new stem cell building that we've uh, built uh, with CIRM as well as a, quite a number of um, philanthrop generous philanthropists. But we were able to build a uh, purpose-built stem cell research center, which is shown here, uh, halfway up Mount Parnassus on the Parnassus campus at UCSF with uh, spectacular views, the Pacific Ocean, you can see the Farallon Islands on a clear day, and uh, green rooftops, which are especially useful now because people can actually eat their lunch or dinner uh, outdoors, and that's much safer than eating inside. So um, it's working well as a uh, sort of coronavirus bastion of research. Very proud of that building. So meanwhile, uh, the talk I was gonna give today, I'm gonna give today, uh, we'll, we'll talk about organoids and some of the uh, studies we've done looking at the fidelity of these organoids. But I thought I would begin with some perspective on uh, human specific features of brain development, something of, along the lines of what Evan suggested. And, and that comes from the fact, obviously, that the cerebral cortex of humans is very different than the cortex of a mouse. And in early stages of development, there are progenitors that are schematically shown here in mouse cortical development. And in contrast, now that we've been, and we and others have been delving into the progenitor populations in human developing cortex, the picture becomes much more complicated. And there are subtypes that are uh, molecularly quite different. And I wanted to highlight some of those differences um, in the beginning of my talk. So the progenitor zones in a mouse throughout corticogenesis, and for that matter, the rest of the nervous system, consist of the radial glial cells, shown here in red because they're stained for SOPS2, and their daughter cells, which are intermediate progenitors or basal progenitors that are sitting in a layer just above the ventricular zone, known as the subventricular zone. Early stages of human development look the same. There are radial glial cells and uh, intermediate progenitors that are generated in a very similar way. But over the sub subsequent few weeks of, of development and up to the peak of neurogenesis shown here, there's a big expansion of that subventricular zone, which is now referred to as the outer subventricular zone. And it's the inner subventricular zone is still there, but there's a little gap in between, which are where fibers run. And this outer subventricular zone is, as you can see in this image on the right, extremely large at gestation week 17, which is when layer four begins to form. And so the rest of the layers that are generated, the upper layers, which are the last to form, are likely to come, and I'll, I'll give you evidence that they do come, from these progenitors in the outer subventricular zone. So that focused our attention on those progenitors, which hadn't been described when we started this about 10 years ago. And I wanna highlight one of these progenitors, a radial glial-like cell. It has a, a cell body you can see on the left with a long radial fiber. Most of these fibers reach the peel surface. These cells stain with all of the radial glial markers, intermediate filaments like phosphovimentin and nestin and uh, so-called stem cell markers like SOX2. But they hadn't been described before. And so uh, we call them outer subventricular zone radial glial-like cells, or ORG cells, ORG cells for short. Um, some people now have been calling them basal radial glia, but uh, I'll be continuing to call them ORG cells. And at UCSF, we are lucky to have uh, tissue that we uh, receive as donations that we're able to treat very much like uh, we would our, uh, our mouse section. So we can slice uh, stain them, uh, incubate, and uh, in this way, culture them for days. So this is a time-lapse image of the outer subventricular zone of a gestation week 18 cortex. And the transcript, the, the uh, vector that we used uh, has a promoter that only is expressed by progenitors. So we don't see neurons here. These are all progenitor cells in this outer subventricular zone. And you can see many of them are dividing and also migrating. And I wanted to highlight the particular way that these outer radial glial cells divide. So I want to show these two movies. Uh, on the left, you can see these cells, for example, the one in the middle, which when it divides, translocates the soma, there it goes, translocates up that fiber before division. And on the right, you can see the cell doing the same thing. That's a characteristic behavior that we've only seen in these cells. And we call it mitotic somal translocation, or MST for short. And that'll be a defining feature of these cells that I'll get to as we continue the talk. So our working model for, <clears throat> for human cortical neurogenesis looks something like this. Uh, there are ventricular radial glia shown here that give rise to intermediate progenitors that divide usually once to produce a pair of neurons. Uh, 
But that quickly changes in human cortical development into this pattern, where these radial glial cells will, when they divide horizontally, produce outer radial glial cells. Those outer radial glial cells, shown in the middle panel, go through a series of asymmetrical self-renewing divisions, where each time they give rise to a daughter cell, which is a transit amplifying cell, divides multiple times to produce a clone of neurons. And that clone of neurons will then migrate into the cortex within the same layer. So over time, as these cells go through multiple rounds of division, they populate a cortical uh, layers from the deeper layer up to the more superficial layers. And at the end of neurogenesis, we now have evidence that these radial glial cells will transform into astrocytes. And we'll talk a little about glial cells later on. So um, starting uh, shortly after we first began looking at human cortex, uh, we adopted a single cell RNA-seq approach to try to disentangle the complexity of the cellular populations in the developing brain. And when we first started, um, we adopted what was then a state of the art, which was a microfluidic uh, platform created by uh, a company in Southern San, uh, South San Francisco at the time. Uh, it'll come to me in a minute. But nonetheless, this allows you to capture up to about 80 or 90 cells at a time. And we dissociated a cortex by microdissecting different regions shown here, the cortical plate, the intermediate zone, subventricular zone, dissociated those cells, captured them, and did single cell RNA sequencing. And so with the first study, which was only at 260 or 70 cells, a relatively pitiful number compared to what we can do today, uh, it was enough uh, to give us a lot of insight into the uh, developmental trajectories of the cells I've mentioned. So here we've got a, a Tisney plot where the color coding is based on canonical marker expression. And the yellow cells are the radial glial cells, and then we have intermediate progenitors in pink, uh, excitatory neurons in blue, and interneurons here in black. So even though it was only a small number of cells, it was enough to identify genes that are uniquely expressed by each of these different populations. So on the left are genes that had not been identified before that label selectively the ventricular radial glia, as shown in these in C2 hybridization panels. And on the right are the genes that our data were predicted to be expressed by the outer radial glial cells. And you can see in the in situ that they are expressed in the right area. And then confirm that uh, they really were labeling outer radial glia. We did um, immunostaining on cells that have the morphology or the behavior, the jumping and dividing behavior that I mentioned earlier, and confirm that these markers, these proteins are expressed in those cells. That gave us a whole new set of tools to use to identify this cell type. And that allowed us to make a series of observations that I just want to describe briefly. One of them is a, a puzzling observation based on these two markers. HOPX is uh, shown here on the left panel in red. It's a marker of the outer radial glia, and it fills the entire cell, so you can see the processes. And these red processes do go all the way up to the peel surface. At the same time, we label these sections with cryo B. Now, cryo B is a marker for the ventricular radial glia. And these uh, radial fibers, the green ones, didn't go all the way up to the cortex. In fact, they ended just about where these outer subventricular zone fibers start. So that suggested that there might be a discontinuous glial scaffold where the ventricular radial glia contribute fibers only halfway through, and the outer radial glial cells contribute fibers that go all the way up to the cortex. And this is different than the canonical model. So we looked for a different way of, of demonstrating this to see if it was true. And we took big slabs of cortex and we put dye I either on the peel surface up here or the ventricular surface down below. And we just did this at a series of developmental ages. And up to around gestation week 15, which is shown here, the glial fibers were continuous, uh, which is what you see in the mouse and what you will be expected to see in humans and primates. But after gestation week 15, for example, 17 or 18, is quite different. If we put dye crystals on the peel surface, they only stain um, they only stain fibers down to the outer subventricular zone, and these fibers end in cell bodies, the ORG cell bodies. And if we put dye at the ventricular surface, it fills the ventricular cells and their fibers, most of which end right here at the outer subventricular zone region. This confirms what we saw with our uh, new marker labeling, and it led us to uh, a new hypothesis about cortical development. Uh, I just want to convince you that uh, when we backfill fibers from the peel surface at these older ages, we, we see the fibers actually originating from cell bodies that are sitting here. These are not cut off or somehow uh, abnormally truncated fibers. And vice versa, these uh, ventricular cells, when we fill them with dye, eye, they very often make these uh, right angle bends and they end, although you don't see it here, they end on blood vessels. Now, we, we now define the cells that are short like this as truncated radial glia, 
And then we have the outer radial glia and we have ventricular radial glia. So now we think there are three different types uh, of distinct uh, radial glial cells. And these cell types, you know, we, we didn't discover them. They've, they've been there for a long time and they've been seen before. And this is a, one of Pasco Ricci's papers uh, based on uh, monkey studies uh, with Golgi stains in 2003. And you can see these profiles, these uh, cells that look exactly, these are the truncated radial glia ending on blood vessels. Uh, this cell B is probably an outer radial glial cell. Uh, these other cells are likely transforming into astrocytes, which I'll get to later. Um, so we just have changed our understanding of how these cells relate to each other. And so this is now our working in progress model of human and we think now primate cortical development. Whereas the deeper cortical layers, the ones that form first, are generated from the ventricular radial glia and their daughter intermediate progenitors, um, which is very much like the mouse, except that there are some outer radial glia contributing to these deeper cortical layer cells. But then uh, halfway through corticogenesis, there's a wave of ORG cell production, and they all migrate away from the ventricular zone, leaving behind these truncated radial glia. And from that point on, which is when the upper cortical layers are formed, they're generated by these outer radial glial cells and their transit amplifying daughters. And those neurons are migrating along those radial fibers to take up their position in the upper cortical layers. And that's very interesting because the uh, supergranular layers, the ones above layer four, have always been referred to since Marin Padilla almost 50 years ago as having a primate specific feature, which is a higher density and a higher cell type variety, it seems, morphologically in the upper cortical layers than the deeper cortical layers. And this is thought to be a primate specific feature. And I think it relates in some way to this difference in the, uh, in the site of origin of the cells in the upper layers versus the deeper layers. And it has implications potentially in terms of cognition because it's the upper cortical layer of pyramidal cells that make cortical-cortical connections, which are thought to be really critical for learning and memory and cognition. And whereas the deeper cortical layers are the, mostly the projection cells that project to subcerebral targets. So this is again, a, a, a new way of looking at the developing cortex and it's still a work in progress. We're still trying to identify what the daughters of these truncated radial glial cells are. There's several interesting some candidates for what they might be doing. Um, and then again, uh, looking at the glial cells that these different uh, radial glial-like cells produce. Now, uh, we were also interested in organoids. And as you know, that was the uh, subject, the title of my talk. So uh, I wanna now turn uh, for a moment to human uh, cortical organoids, which we've been growing uh, following most of the protocols that I think are being widely used these days. And in our organoids, once they reach around 10 to 15 weeks, looking at single cell gene expression, and this is a heat map, of genes that uh, have been highlighted with this red uh, oval, because these that appear after 10 or 15 weeks are the genes that we associate with these fetal outer radial glial cells I've been talking about. And that suggested that we were getting outer radial glial cells in our organoids. And so we uh, section stained, um, uh, stained them in living sections and did time-lapse imaging as I've shown you before in our uh, acute sections and found cells like this one. Uh, this is a looped film, it's not uh, going over these divisions, it just divides once. But it, it is an outer radial glial cell by morphology and it undergoes that jump in division behavior exactly like we saw in fetal cells. So there do appear to be outer radial glial cells in our cortical organoids. That allowed us to look at the role these cells might play in diseases. And the first uh, disorder I wanted to highlight was this one, listen cephaly where um, babies are born with a smooth cortex, that is, they don't have the usual cortical folding. And this is actually a very severe case of lysencephaly called miller deeker lysencephaly. Uh, that's because a, a, a short arm uh, of uh, one of the genes is entirely deleted with about 13 uh, individual genes, a, a short arm of one of the chromosomes rather, with around 13 genes, including the LIS1 gene, which is by itself able to produce a smooth or lysencephalic cortex. And there's some microcephaly, the brain is smaller as well. So just to make a long story short, um, we discovered a, 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 a disorder that was specifically targeting these outer radial glial cells. And these are uh, some time-lapse images, uh, just frames of those movies showing one of these outer radial glial cells from an organoid derived from a patient who has Miller-Deeker syndrome. And when these cells divide, they jump much farther than uh, they normally would, and then they arrest in division. And this is a phenotype which we've come to understand is due to microtubule dysfunction. And the LIS1 gene is known to be a microtubule associated protein. So it's not a big surprise that we found a defect in microtubules in these progenitors. What is interesting 
is that the only progenitors that uh, had this defect were the outer radioglial cells, the ventricular radioglia, the intermediate progenitors, they seem to divide perfectly well. It was the outer radioglial cells that were abnormal. And I, I, I think that finding highlights the role that these, plays, these cells play, uh, both for cortical expansion, the large growth of the size of the cortex, as well as uh, the folding perhaps of the cortex at the same time, because obviously when there's a defect in these cells, it contributes to lysin cephaly. Uh, yeah, so this is just uh, quantifying the difference I just told you in comparing uh, ventricular radioglia to the outer radioglia. The other thing that we noticed when we did our first uh, single cell RNA-seq study is that the genes that, highlighted, um, that were highlighted in these uh, outer radioglial cells uh, were not random genes. They fell into activated um, signaling networks, and those could fall into these three categories, uh, extracellular matrix production, the epithelial to mesenchymal transition, which we think is how these cells originate in the first place, and stem cell maintenance or self-renewal. And all of those pathways have been described in the literature as being enriched in the very aggressive forms of glioblastoma, which is, as probably all of you know, is a very aggressive brain tumor, but it's an adult brain tumor, um, and it, it, it is highly invasive. So we wondered if ORG-like cells were present in these tumors, and we were able to get samples from our neurosurgical colleagues and did um, RNA sequencing on those, and found the ORG signatures highlighted here uh, gene signatures to be enriched in the most aggressive form, the so-called uh, mesenchymal form of, of, of glioblastoma multiforme. So we looked at our samples, were acute samples that were delivered directly from the uh, OR, sectioned them, stained them, and cultured them. And as shown here on the right, you had cells that looked very much like those outer radioglia in morphology. And in our time-lapse images, they jumped and divided, that MST behavior I mentioned earlier. So it looks as though we have ORG-like cells in these glioblastoma samples. We then received uh, quite a number of uh, tumor samples and started to look at the candidate cell types that people have considered as uh, tumor originating cells for glioblastoma. And they're listed here. Um, these are adult uh, astrocytes, the fibrous form of astrocytes, the protoplasmic astrocytes, uh, OPCs, adult OPCs or uh, fetal or developing OPCs. Uh, developing radioglia and intermediate progenitors shown here. And what I want to highlight on these graphs is that the highest correlation between the tumor cells and our fetal samples and these different progenitors was with these radioglial cells. So it looked as though, uh, though there were some cells that resembled OPCs, it was mostly the radioglial cells that, that gave us the highest correlation. And when we looked at modules of gene expression uh, in these tumor cells, we found that they look very much like the outer radioglia uh, module shown here. This is actually the uh, tumor cells, but I've highlighted the orange and red ones, which are common to both fetal and tumor ORG-like cells. And one of the most highly expressed genes, which is a marker gene for the cell type, is PTPRZ1 highlighted here. Now, the reason I want to highlight PTPRZ1 is just after we made our findings, uh, we came across this paper, which had been published uh, just a few months before, and it looked at uh, glioblastoma and the role of PTPRZ1 in uh, tumor invasion and spread. So they took uh, tumors um, that were grafted into animals, as shown here, and when they put them into the mouse, within you know, three or four weeks, they formed uh, tumors in the mouse brain. However, when they knocked down PTPRZ1 uh, using a variety of different uh, constructs, so more than one, they found that the invasion was significantly reduced and sometimes even uh, prevented, suggesting that PTPRZ1 was playing a role in tumor spread. So we took some of our tumor samples um, and enriched for the outer radioglia-like cells, the PTPRZ1 positive fraction, and then we had a depleted fraction that was depleted of these cells, and we grafted those into organoids. We found that uh, human organoids are really a very good culture um, platform for these tumor cells. They do much better and grow much more quickly in these human organoids than they do in the mouse brain. And we found that the PTPRZ1 enriched fraction of cells um, widely migrated within this organoid. Um, they generated a diversity of cell types, of daughter cell types, which matched the uh, diversity that we see in the primary tumor originally. So we think the PTPRZ1 fraction, namely these ORG-like cells, are capable of regenerating the entire tumor. And therefore, we, we think these ORG-like cells are uh, a form of GBM stem cell. 
but I should point out they're probably not the only stem cells because we also found that some of our depleted fractions were able to also produce a diversity of cell types that closely match the original tumor. So we think there may be more than one form of cell uh, that is a tumor originating cell, but we think these origin cells uh, probably fit that definition as well. Now, since our init uh, initial study, which was, as I mentioned, only 250 cells, we've been uh, using drop seek methods and expanding our uh, throughput, as it were, and the number of cells that we're looking at. So uh, this is a more recent study where we looked from 11 post-conceptional weeks all the way to 21.5, which covers the period of peak uh, corticogenesis. And uh, this is a fluidime study. This is the microfluidic platform. Just before uh, it was taken, you know, we moved on to um, drop seek methods. But this gave us many more clusters. Um, it gave us a, a very rich data set to investigate both uh, post mitotic cells as well as the progenitor cells and others, including uh, endothelial cells and astrocytes and glial cells. But in addition to just looking at the individual genes, um, we really took advantage of weighted gene co expression network analysis, WGCNA which allows us to look at uh, coherent uh, genes that are changing within individual cell types in a coherent way because they're linked to a similar or maybe the same molecular pathway. And, and these are defining uh, modules for these individual cells can give us some insight into the function of these genes and how they work together. And going back to my favorite cell type, the outer radial glial cell, our data showed uh, a dozen or more membrane associated receptors that seem uniquely expressed or enriched in outer radial glial cells. And I wanted to highlight one of these pathways. Uh, it's the LIFR STAT3 signaling pathway, which in many other stem cell models uh, is a self renewal promoting uh, pathway. And as shown in these immunostains, uh, the LIFR, <clears throat> LIFR receptor is uniquely expressed in the SOX2 positive population, not in the TBR2, the, the EOMS population, which are the intermediate progenitors of transit amplifying cells. So the ORG cells express LIFR, but not their immediate daughter cells, those transit amplifying cells that they produce. And that's confirmed uh, here on the right. Uh, the SOX2 cells also express STAT3, which, are, which is part of that LIFR signaling pathway. So because the ORG cells are uniquely uh, expressing this pathway, uh, we wondered if we could take advantage of that in our organoid cultures, because the organoids, and there's one shown here on the left that we were growing, uh, had outer radial but not that many. So here again, in HOPX as a red stain, you can see there are some of these outer radial glia in our normal organoids, uh, but we didn't have as many as we wanted and we didn't have as many upper cortical layer neurons we thought maybe as a result. So we added LIF for uh, uh, two weeks in culture and, and found that there was a huge increase in the number of uh, HOPX positive outer radial glia-like cells uh, when we added LIF to the medium. And I think this tells us two things. Uh, first, it, it nicely uh, confirms the observation that LIFR uh, STAT3 signaling is a self-renewal pathway in outer radial glial cells. That's very nice to see. It also tells us that these organoids um, you know, are, are good models, but they, they're not necessarily um, reproducing all of the signaling to the level that you normally see in a developing brain. And that if we knew about LIF or other missing signaling factors, uh, we could modify the way or improve, in, in a sense, the way organoids are grown. Uh, so this is just one example of that. And I can mention that uh, Ben Novich at UCLA has also used uh, LIF um, to improve the, or increase the number of ORG-like cells in his organoids. Another uh, signaling pathway that's enriched in outer radial glial cells is the mTOR signaling pathway. And I, I diagram some of the genes that are expressed in, uh, in, in these outer radial glia in a different way in these two-dimensional uh, maps. Um, but uh, just suffice it, if any of you want to know more about how these were done, I'm happy to do that. Uh, but I just want to mention that this shows the time dependent and spatial dependent expression of each one of these genes and shows that they appear when the outer radial glial cells uh, mature in developing cortex. And to confirm that, we used uh, antibody to phospho S6, which is a readout of activated um, mTOR signaling. And you can see here on the right at a higher power, a single outer radial glial cell whose entire cytoplasm uh, is really uh, enriched with this phospho S6 signal and uh, highlights the fact that these adorative glia do have activated mTOR signaling going on. The reason we're interested in mTOR signaling, some of you may know, is a pathway that's been uh, implicated in autism and tuberous sclerosis and macrocephaly. So uh, we'll get back to mTOR signaling as we go along. 
So what is the role of mTOR signaling in these ORG cells? Uh, some cells that have mTOR activation are using that as a growth signal and growth pathways. Um, it can also have cytoskeletal effects. And in our uh, hands, when we took these uh, human cortical sections and treated them uh, with rapamycin, which is an inhibitor of the mTOR signaling pathway, we found that the radial fibers, the outer radial glia radial fibers, um, were truncated. And moreover, um, when we took these cells in isolation and treated them with rapamycin, we found that the cell body sprouted multiple processes, as you can see here on the right, whereas the normal adorated glial cells have either none or one uh, apically directed fiber. So there's a change in the cytoskeleton when we inhibit mTOR signaling in these adorated glial cells. And to make a long story short, it, it turns out that in these cells, uh, mTOR signaling is most important because of its role in modifying the actin cytoskeleton in a pathway that's, that's shown here. And we think that that could cause uh, migration problems, and it can also, of course, cause problems with uh, proliferation. But, but the migration problem uh, might actually be more important when it comes to disease phenotypes. Now, um, I've introduced organoids a little bit. Um, we spent a fair amount of time, and we still are, comparing organoids to primary tissue. We're in a, a, not a unique position, but a good position to make that comparison because we've been studying primary tissue for many years now, and we also have organoids growing in the lab. So we've uh, helped to define this uh, pathway or trajectory of uh, cell type diversity that happens during normal fetal development. And we're in a position to compare that to what happens during organoid development. And we've uh, begun to do this in a, a, a few papers. First of all, as you probably all know, um, when we grow cortical organoids, uh, as opposed to say um, uh, uh, gastric or uh, GI organoids, uh, those you can, uh, you can take from an adult and grow them in a laboratory without reproducing or uh, going through developmental stages. But for the brain, and, and in this case, cerebral cortex, we really have to follow a developmental program, starting with pluripotent stem cells, shown here on the left as an iPS colony, and then progressing through embryoid bodies, and then driving uh, neural fate and dorsal cortical fate to eventually get uh, what we call a cortical or cerebral organoid. Uh, these are cross sections shown on the bottom um, that uh, highlight the uh, beautiful organization of the progenitor zones that one sees in our early stages of of, uh, of neural development. They have uh, radial glial cells that have apical basal polarity, uh, usually clustered around a kind of ventricle, and they, and they form rosettes, which are the classic feature of these uh, neurogenic uh, organoids. So we've compared them now, as I mentioned, a number of ways to fetal tissue. Uh, one of the obvious differences is structural. And, and these are cross sections of different stages of human cortical development. Uh, stained with markers for different cell types, as shown here on the left. And then looking at organoids at roughly comparable stages of development using the same uh, marker genes, so you can see the colors match, you can see right away that there are some major differences. There are differences, obviously, in the cortical organization, uh, and the organoids uh, are, are much less well organized. Um, and as they mature, they don't have the beautiful uh, exquisite layering that occurs in normally developing cortex, Although they do, as you can see by the colors, they do have a variety of different cell types. So we looked more carefully at that, and we did that uh, by comparing studies of uh, fetal tissue with uh, many, many organoids that we were growing. So first I wanna show you these. Uh, this is a, a, a Tisney plot of the cells that we collected from, as shown here, uh, five individuals, seven cortical areas, from gestation week six to 22, which again, spans most of cortical neurogenesis. And we found you know, multiple, multiple cell types, but I wanna highlight the ones here on the right by the uh, canonical genes that they express. Uh, there are progenitors, uh, the outer radial glial cells that are clustered here, which express HOPX, uh, the intermediate progenitors shown here, which express eomes, and down below are uh, newborn neurons on the left, maturing neurons, and then inhibitory cells on the right. So these are the data from our fetal samples. We also collected um, cortical organoids, as shown here uh, from weeks three to 10, which roughly corresponds to the period I've just talked about in fetal tissue. We used four cell lines and we mixed uh, three different protocols, which were giving us all very much the same results. And the overall Tisney plots are shown here on the left. 
And on the right, I'm showing you the same genes uh, that I showed you before. And among the differences are the amount of cell types present. So in these organoids, we have quite a number of SOX2 positive progenitors, the radioglia-like cells, um, much fewer of the HOPX positive outer radioglia, and even fewer of the intermediate progenitors, the TBR2 positive cells. Uh, in terms of neurons, uh, we have quite a number of newborn or immature neurons, not so much uh, mature cells, and of course, not that many inhibitory neurons either. But if we dig, dig deeper into the actual genes that each of these cell types express, we were struck um, by this, that in the fetal tissue, we have cell type defining genes, genes that are enriched in just one cell type compared to all the others. Uh, and if we look at across all cell types, we found around 600 of these genes. If we do the same in our organoids, we found only 46 that were truly enriched uniquely in an individual cell type. And uh, only five of these genes were conserved with the same genes. So gene expression is, is impoverished when you compare the same cell type from fetal tissue to organoid. And part of that may be this heterogeneity is diminished. And as you mentioned, the height of these bars uh, tell you how many different uh, subtypes there are within each cluster. And in the fetal uh, excitatory neurons, we have multiple different uh, cell types or clusters but not so much in the excitatory neurons from organoids. In fact, the organoids generally fall into either upper cortical layer or deeper cortical layer neurons. They're kind of almost like a pan neuronal identity, whereas the fetal cells have much more diversity, including aerialization that we don't see in the organoids. And that's true for every other cell type shown here. And the third feature I wanted to highlight is the cell identity, which is a little bit confused. So on the right, I'm showing in brown, uh, gene expression for primary uh, radioglial cells. That's down here on the bottom. And the radioglial genes that are expressed um, do not overlap with the neural genes, which are shown here. And the neural genes in brown don't overlap with the radioglial genes. But in organoids, shown here in blue, uh, most of the outer radioglia, or the radioglia in general, will express uh, genes found in neurons as well as in radioglia. And the neurons will express genes found in radioglia as well as in neurons. So they have, in the organoids, a blended identity that we don't see in primary tissue. Now, another way I mentioned of looking at our data has been to use WGCNA to look at uh, modules of gene expression. And when we look at modules that are uniquely expressed by organoids in radioglial cells, uh, we ha have a very good correlation with fetal cells. And the same is true for intermediate progenitors, excitatory neurons, and inhibitory neurons. So that it looks as though the uh, network of gene expression, those modules of genes that are important, uh, we think for the function and identity of these different cell types, does seem to be preserved in organoids, which is good news. And if we look at these plots of those, uh, uh, those uh, defining modules of gene expression in each of these cell types, uh, they compare very well to their fetal cells. So it looks as though the main hub genes are all conserved in these cell types, and, and they're reasonably good matches for their fetal uh, counterparts in a general sense. But there are some important differences between the organoids and primary tissue. And some of those differences are highlighted here. The organoids are enriched in glycolysis genes, the ones that are uh, indicative of metabolic stress. So if you look at the violin plots on the right, uh, the first two represent primary fetal tissue and uh, the uh, five on the right represent different organoids. And as you can see for these two genes, PGK1 and uh, ALDOA, these are glycolysis uh, network genes. They're highly expressed or enriched in the organoids, but not in primary tissue. Similarly, endoplasmic reticulum stress network genes are highly expressed in organoids, again, shown in the violin plots here to the right, compared to primary tissue where they really are not very uh, exp expressed at high levels at all. So what does this mean? Um, well, uh, first we wanted to make sure that it wasn't just our organoids in our lab that showed this stress. And so we looked across protocols that had been published, single cell data for many other studies. The studies are shown here on the right. And the data, uh, which is plotted here, showed that across all these protocols, there's an increase in uh, glycolysis and, and, and metabolic stress. And it's not just because of the ages of the organoids. It's not something they grow out of, as it were. Uh, we looked across ages, uh, in this case, from week three to week 24. And we find uh, all across these ages, the same problems with cell stress that I mentioned earlier. And so we think this is something that one has to take into account 
when you're interpreting disease phenotypes in organoids. In particular, people have been using organoids to look at neurodegenerative disorders, for instance, and, and they're all associated with some degree of uh, metabolic stress to begin with. Possibly that's why uh, fetal models like organoids can show a phenotype for an adult disease. Um, I'm not sure, um, but it's an interesting thing to keep in mind when you're trying to interpret your data, and especially when you're modeling a metabolic disorder. So I mentioned two problems with these organoids, the fact that they uh, are metabolically stressed and that their cell identity is, uh, is a little abnormal compared to fetal cells. So to sort these out and see if they could be reversed, uh, we first took our organoids and transplanted them into mouse cortex. So we had our organoids in culture at different ages. Uh, we labeled them with our viral vector and dissociated the cells and then grafted them into the brain of a mouse. And then after a period of survival, usually a month or two, we uh, removed, sacrificed the animal, removed the cells, fact sorted to enrich for them and did single cell RNA sequencing and immunohistochemistry. What we found is that the organoid cells which start out having uh, high levels of stress, for example, shown here in the uh, bar graphs at the bottom, uh, actually, the stress goes down over a month to the point where they look very much like their fetal cells. And the morphology of the cells improves over that time. And if we look at the single cell RNA sequencing of these cells that we extract after a month and then sequence, we find that they're much uh, better uh, in terms of their fidelity than they were to begin with. So we see both a reduction in stress and an improvement in their molecular identity. Then we did the opposite. We took our primary cells, you know, which uh, have very little stress and as far as we know, uh, ideal identity, labeled them and injected them into organoids. And then after a period of survival, uh, facts sorted to remove them and then did single cell RNA sequencing and immunohistochemistry. What we found is that these normal cells from the fetal tissue developed stress marker gene expression shown here. Uh, their morphology was somewhat stunted and their subtype identity was degraded. So uh, clearly these two features, uh, stress and, uh, and cell type identity, which may or may not be directly related, they're both reversible. And uh, we think basically that the organoid environment is the problem, that it hasn't been optimized for the growth of these cell types. And that it's possible, we think, to improve the culture conditions. And that maybe by getting rid of the stress, we'll be able to improve the fidelity of the cells. Now, I mentioned our uh, earlier studies uh, for uh, progressively larger and larger numbers of cells. We have also been extending our more recent studies to earlier stages. And we're especially interested in the stage of transition between the neuropathelial cells, which form the neural plate and then eventually the neural tube, and the radioglia. Because that transition from neuropathelial cells to radioglia occurs uh, when neurons are born. That is, the neurons are really generated, we think, by radioglial cells and they start to be generated in number, reasonable numbers at the point of this transition. And that's a transition that really hasn't been very well studied. And so um, we were able to collect tissue as shown here from Carnegie stage 14, which is the uh, neural plate stage just before the neural tube closes and compare that to tissue, for example, here at Carnegie stage 22, which is after the neuropathelial to radioglial transition. And that's highlighted in uh, this panel that shows a ZO1 expression in blue, you can see that it's expressed uh, at these um, fetal stages that are before, uh, neuropathelial stages before neurogenesis, and that gets turned off when the cells reach uh, radioglial stages and start producing neurons. So we've done uh, single cell RNA sequencing across all these different ages, and to make a long story short, uh, as highlighted here, we find nine clusters of uh, progenitor cells in this neuropathelial to radioglial transition period. And we're starting to look at each one of these different clusters, and I'll highlight some of the features in the next few slides. First of all, we find uh, evidence uh, through our uh, bioinformatic analysis for both direct and indirect neurogenesis. So the direct neurogenesis are uh, neuropathelial or progenitor cells. In this case, they just become uh, radioglial-like and start producing neurons directly. We also have uh, the beginning of indirect neurogenesis, which is that these neuropathelial or radioglial-like cells produce intermediate progenitor cells that then produce neurons. So we find both direct and indirect neurogenesis pathways in our data set. We also, of course, because we uh, have sampled at a reasonable uh, sequence of uh, ages, we can look at uh, dynamic changes in gene expression 
during this transition from norepithelial to radioglia. And I've highlighted some of those uh, patterns here where some genes are uh, enriched and highly expressed during norepithelial stages and they get downregulated at this transition while other genes get upregulated in the radioglia that are not regulated, not upregulated in the epithelial uh, cell stages. And I wanna show you one example here, which is notch one, it's shown here in blue, at a series of different ages from Carnegie stage 13 at the top to Carnegie stage 22 at the bottom. And you can see how it appears, it becomes highly enriched and then uh, goes down in expression, which is uh, where that curve I show you on the left comes from. So we compared um, mouse and human and also primary tissue to organoids. And I just wanna give you one example for a gene c one orf 61 shown here in red. Uh, it appears in human fetal tissue at the neuropathelial stage. It's very highly enriched uh, just as uh, radioglia start to develop. And when the radioglia take over, it's downregulated. So it's, it's one of those genes, again, that's enriched during those stages of uh, the neuropathelial uh, neural tube closure. We looked in our human organoids and found the same gene is expressed in progenitors um, at the appropriate stage, which is gratifying to see. Uh, through a, a collaboration with uh, Alex Pollan at UCSF, we were able to get chimp organoids. Uh, and as shown here, we found that uh, this gene is also expressed in the chimp organoids. So it's a primate uh, gene, but we didn't find it in the mouse uh, as shown here. We looked at a whole range of different ages that could overlap with the human uh, ages I've shown you. Uh, but this is not a gene that's expressed in neuropathelial cells in the mouse. And this is just one example. We found genes that are expressed in mouse, uh, but they're not expressed in human. Uh, but most often we find genes in human that we don't see in the mouse. And some of them we don't see in the human organoids either. Um, but those are stories I, I don't have uh, completed yet, so I can't tell you all about that. But the other thing we noticed was that many of the genes uh, expressed in this transition period from norepithelial cells to early radioglia, uh, which are shown here, have been associated with diseases. Um, and so we think that these cells, this progenitor uh, age, could be the uh, early stages for expression of uh, neurodevelopmental diseases that really haven't been modeled yet. Now, there are some cell types that are underrepresented in our single cell data sets. And one of those tells is uh, this form of outer uh, of, of um, oligodendrocyte precursor, OPC. These OPC cells um, express a variety of markers, including PGF receptor alpha on their membrane. And so that allowed a, a postdoc in my lab, um, a Wei Wang, to actually subdissect parts of our uh, fresh cortical samples, dissociate the cells, and then using immunopanning, uh, where she uh, allows the cells to come in contact with uh, a PGF receptor antibody uh, covered uh, dishes, petri dishes, uh, she could enrich for the cells that stick to the petri dish, which are presumably the PGF receptor alpha expressing cells, which are the OPCs, presumably. She then collected these cells, um, did single cell RNA sequencing to confirm their identity. And as shown here, these post immunopan cells, the ones that are enriched, uh, were all expressing PGF receptor alpha and NKX 2.2, which is a marker for uh, OPCs. And uh, the single cell data, the cluster shown here, uh, as you can see, is very highly enriched for PGF receptor alpha. So this immunopanning technique worked very nicely for uh, enriching, highly enriching this otherwise very rare cell type in our data set. And also it was gentle enough, shown here on the left, uh, that the cells could actually survive and uh, be quite happy afterwards, unlike fact sorting, which turns out to be very, uh, uh, very much more damaging to the cells. So among other things, we uh, were able to put our data set for OPCs together with uh, bioinformatic uh, paradigms that allow you to look at lineage tracing and found that neural progenitor cells shown here in pink uh, bifurcate here to produce either intermediate progenitors and neurons, a neurogenic lineage, or pre-OPC and OPC cells shown here. So up to a, a stage where the adorated glial cells are starting to form, we can see a common progenitor for both neurons and oligos, but then that diverges before neurons are born. There's a, a population uh, that's in a sense set aside for making oligodendrocytes, while uh, another lineage goes on to make neurons. And the cells uh, at this uh, point where they start to make oligodendrocytes turn out to be, in the cortex at least, outer radial like cells. And one of them is shown here on the left. Uh, 
in green because it expresses phospho S6. Remember, this is a readout for mTOR signaling, which I say was enriched in atoradioglia. Well, here's an atoradioglial cell at this early stage, enriched in uh, uh, mTOR signaling. But the cells that express EGF receptor, the ones that are the progenitors for, radio, for um, OPCs, are ORG-like cells that do not express uh, mTOR enhancement. And that's easier to see in the merge image on the right. So we have ORG cells that make OPCs that are not the ones that are expressing mTOR, and the ones that are expressing mTOR, which are uh, the neural committed ORG cells. So we can define uh, this branch point of ORGs that are gliogenic versus the ORGs that are neurogenic. And one of the differences is the mTOR signaling pathway. So what Wei did, which is I thought really quite heroic, is she was able to take these immunopanned cells, label them with a virus infection, and then uh, graft them back onto cortical slices that came from the same tissue as the original dissociated cells that she panned. So she was able to take the label cells and lay them on top of a cortical slice. And it turns out that these label cells then integrated into the cortical slice and behaved um, as they would if they were in primary tissue. And these are examples of some time-lapse images of the behavior. You might recognize uh, adorated glial cells here which jump and divide um, as they normally would, and uh, other intermediate progenitors that uh, round up and divide, uh, all the different dynamic behaviors were observed. But when she enriched for these OPC cells uh, and then grafted those into her cultures, uh, the slice cultures, she was able to see uh, this repetitive division behavior that I wanna highlight in this time-lapse image. And if you look at the cell in the middle, and it'll divide and produce daughters, and you have to try to watch them all. It's a little difficult, uh, but it'll go through multiple divisions. I'll give you a warning. So you can see the cell rounded up and divided right there. And then these two daughter cells migrate away. And then around the same time, they'll round up and divide themselves. There, this one and the other one. They both divided at around the same time. And this goes on for multiple rounds of division. And that allowed us to say that these pre-OPCs, the OPCs that come at the early stages from outer radial wheel cells, that, that they actually expand symmetrically uh, over and over again to cause a huge increase in number of early OPCs and eventually myelinating oligodendrocytes. And we think that this step uh, of highly, uh, highly mitotic pre-OPC cells, which we define by a combination of marker expression, that, that these are not found in the mouse and that they are responsible for uh, the huge expansion in white matter that occurs during development and evolution uh, that isn't present, for example, in small brain mammals like um, the mouse. Uh, and the ability of these cells to self-renew and divide and divide and divide so many times is what we think is really uh, exponentially increasing the population of uh, oligodendrocytes in the end. Now, the final thing I wanted to leave you with is an evolutionary perspective. And um, to study evolution, you need to really look across uh, different species. One has to compare existing species because humans and our nearest living relatives, the chimpanzees, diverged uh, from a common ancestor about 6 million years ago. So any features that, that say are human specific would have had to arise sometime within the last 6 million years after uh, our uh, separation from, from the great apes and the chimpanzees. The problem with that is that we uh, really don't have fetal tissue samples to study uh, from, from uh, chimpanzee fetuses. Uh, as we know, we have an uh, opportunity to study uh, human donated samples, and we can look at macaque, which is another non-human primate. It's an outgroup, as it were, but we can't really look at the chimpanzee directly. And so Alex Pollan, who I mentioned earlier, he came to my lab as a postdoc um, because he was a, a, a evolutionary biologist, very interested in human specific features of brain development. And uh, he set about growing organoids from multiple individual chimpanzees, gorillas, um, monkeys of different sorts, and of course uh, our human organoids. And it took him a few years to come up with a protocol that worked equally well across all these species, uh, but he did eventually and uh, demonstrate that uh, he could grow organoids that were very comparable across species. And we focused on the chimpanzee for the reasons I've just mentioned uh, about its evolutionary significance. And when doing our single cell RNA sequencing evaluation of uh, multiple human samples, here we used 48 of them, compared to uh, uh, organoids derived from multiple individual uh, monkeys, including here six of them, uh, we were able to see that they uh, 
overlapped in a way that allowed us to compare head to head individual cell types from uh, human and non-human primate. So here are the organoid samples um, and uh, above here, uh, the human and uh, macaque samples. Uh, and here are the chimpanzee organoid and human organoid. And we were able to get all of these uh, to generate the same cell types uh, that we could cluster together and therefore start looking head to head how the same cell type at the same stage in development compares across species. And for example, if we're looking at cell type specific differences between radial glia across species, that's shown here with several genes. So ETNK1 and TMEM33, shown here in these violin plots, were highly expressed in radial glial cells from primary human tissue in pink and from human organoids, shown here in brown. But as you can see, they were not expressed essentially in macaque uh, fetal tissue or in chimpanzee organoids. So these are two genes that you could say are uh, human specific. They're not found in either the chimpanzee or the macaque outgroup, but they're present in human uh, radiolial cells. And then we also found genes that have the opposite pattern. They were expressed in the uh, macaque primary tissue and the chimpanzee organoids, but not in human either primary or organoid tissue. So this gene, KPNA4, is a gene that was lost in human evolution after we diverged from our chimp ancestor. And it's cell type specific. That is, these are genes that were found in radial glia, not in other cell types. So we have a list now of these genes. And one of the patterns we found that was really intriguing is shown here. Uh, this shows a heat map of the genes listed on the right, which are part of the mTOR signaling pathway. And as I've indicated before, the mTOR signaling genes are highly enriched in outer radial glial cells in fetal tissue, human fetal tissue. And reassuringly, they were also enriched in human organoids, very much the same. As you know, I, I mentioned the outer radial glial cells appear in our organoids. And so they express the same genes, including this enriched pattern of mTOR expression. But what's interesting in this data set is that the primary um, macaque tissue and the chimpanzee organoids, those are outer radial glial cells do not express this enhanced uh, mTOR signaling uh, pattern that we see in human cells. So that allows us to say that the mTOR signaling enrichment in adoradial glia, which I highlighted earlier in my talk, that is now uh, what we think is human specific, meaning that it's not, uh, not only is it not expressed in the mouse, it's not found in, uh, in non-human primates either. So if one is studying a disease where say mTOR signaling pathways are important, uh, and that may include autism, it may mean that uh, not only can't you use a mouse model, but you probably can't even use a non-human primate model, but you could use, we think, uh, human models, including uh, human organoid models. And this just is a confirmatory study where we looked at fetal tissue from a cac and stained it with PS6, that uh, readout of mTOR signaling, and shown here quantified, um, we confirmed that there isn't much mTOR signaling in adoradia in non-human primates. So I thought I would end there. Um, I covered a fair amount of territory. I just want to highlight some of those conclusions. First, that there's a greater diversity of neural stem cell subtypes in developing human brain than in the mouse. That the human cell type specific genetic programs um, are not always present in the mouse. And, and for multiple diseases that require understanding of those pathways, it may not be possible to actually model them in a mouse. And organoids uh, have validated features that can reveal developmental and disease mechanisms, which I think are the big advantage and, and the attraction that they have. Uh, but you have to keep in mind some of the problems, including, uh, as I've demonstrated here, the activated stress pathways and the cell type identity, uh, which is not as crisp uh, as it should be. And uh, finally, I want to thank the people in my lab uh, listed here on the left. Uh, who have contributed to this project. And uh, I want to highlight especially uh, two postdocs, Aparna and uh, Madeline, uh, who've done some wonderful work that uh, I described in terms of the organoids and also early cortical development. And Ugoma Eze, who's an MD PhD student in the lab, uh, who contributed significantly to the work on neuroepithelial cells. And then uh, our funding sources, which are really important, especially the brain initiative. And CIRM, as uh, you heard, um, might uh, have a, a, a new. Uh, a lease on life, and that would be terrific. Um, they've been very helpful both to my lab and of course to the stem cell effort at UCSF. Um, so with that, uh, we can return to the big screen. That's great. That was that was a tour de force, Arnold. I'm 
so pleased that you were able to present that. So um, questions have been coming in and I'll try to, I'll try to field them as they come in. Um, one of the first questions is uh, this phenomenon of cell types becoming depleted that you uh, observed in the organoids. Do you think that that's related to the age of the organoids? For example, uh, you had shown that you were looking at 10 week organoids. What about if you had looked at organoids that were six months old? Right, so I'm not entirely sure which cell types that Pert's referring to, but uh, let me just give you the example, just because I may not have expressed myself well enough, that LIF are STAT3 signaling pathway. So normally uh, LIF, the leukemia inhibitory factor that activates the receptor, is also produced by those uh, radial glial cells. So it's a, a, literally a self-renewal pathway. It's released, secreted by the same cells that when activated, um, promote division and self-renewal. And so um, if you don't have very many ORG cells to begin with, which is what we see in our normal organoids, then there isn't enough of a signal. Um, and, and they're not, of course, spatially confined the way they are in normally developing cortex. There just isn't enough of that signal to produce the normal uh, quantity of ORG cells. And similarly, you then lose the cells that those progenitors produce, which are a subtype of astrocyte, and we think also upper cortical layer neurons. So we can, uh, comp we can uh, compensate for that deficiency by adding lift to our cultures, as I showed you, and then you get more ORG cells and eventually more of the cells that they produce. So it's an example of how the organoids you know, are doing a reasonably good job of making these uh, diverse cell types, um, but they, uh, they often fall short of what happens in normal development. And if we understood a little bit better, as we're beginning to, you know, what's, uh, what's important for each of those cell types to pr be produced in reasonable numbers and at the right uh, level of molecular identity, uh, we can tweak the protocols that we use to make organoids in order to improve them, as it were, to make them more like what you'd see in normal development. Um, so, so I think there are cell types, you know, that are missing in the organoids, but I think that if we understood a little bit more about their lineages and in a case like this, some of the signaling pathways that are involved in their identity or in their production, uh, we could, again, tweak the, the paradigm to get them uh, to be represented in, in larger numbers. Um, so so that, I don't know if that's the question that's been asked about, uh, uh, you know, cells that don't appear, but... Uh, the other problem, of course, is that we don't have cells that uh, don't come from the dorsal cortex. We don't have very many cortical interneurons, which come from the ventral forebrain, and we don't have endothelial cells at all. We don't have microglia. And as you probably know, people can uh, grow those separately and then add them into organoids uh, to look at interactions or signaling pathways that go across those cell types. Um, so I think this the whole technology of organoids is very exciting, but it, it still has a ways to go. The next question comes from uh, Shelley Halpain. And She's querying whether monolayer human IPS-derived cultures show a similar stress signature as you've seen in the organoids. Yeah, yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, so when we first saw this uh, high signal of stress, we assumed that that was in the uh, core of these organoids, which eventually becomes necrotic. So we took some sections and immunostained them for um, stress markers. And we're very surprised to see that the biggest stress was actually not in the center or the core, but around the periphery. And then we did look at uh, two-dimensional cultures and saw exactly the same thing. So the cell stress is not because of hypoxia or, or lack of perfusion or anything of that sort. It's something about probably the culture media. And, and that may go back historically to the fact that when um, cells were first cultured in a laboratory, and this is you know, 80, 90 years ago, uh, those were, they were tumor cells, they were cancer cell lines. And so the media that was formulated to grow cells in culture uh, were, was media that really uh, was very good for growing cancer cells. And then it was adapted for non-cancer cell types. And you know, maybe there's something, I, I suspect there's something that's either missing or that's in there um, in the media itself that, or the way that the you know, cultures are usually grown uh, that isn't the ideal. And you know, that could be identified and therefore um, you know, once adjusted could actually reduce the stress. And we're hoping if you reduce the stress, you'll improve the cell identity. We just don't know that for a fact yet, but you know, I think that's likely. Well, actually I might interject. Why do you think that your primary slices don't start experiencing stress 
the longer they're in culture, or or do they start doing? Yeah, that? I think if you kept kept them longer in culture, they probably would. Um, so we only culture them for about a week or so. Um, we find that after a week, uh, the organization is is very disrupted, and the advantage of culturing slices, you know, is really to preserve that in situ organization. Uh, and so most of our studies end in cultured slices end within a week. And I think if we extended them longer, we would probably find a difference. And I should mention though that we weren't comparing our organoids to cultured tissue slices. We compared our organoids to um, fresh slices that were dissociated and, and, and uh, you know, where we did whole cell sequencing uh, very acutely. So they, you know, were as close as possible to the uh, actual in situ environment. Right. But you, you suspect because just by definition, we're creating a, an artificial environment that had you, if you did carry your primary tissue longer, they would start experiencing stress yes, as well. That's right. That's right. Because we do culture them in you know, the same culture media that we use for our organoids. That's interesting. Well, it, it's also interesting, and this is just not a question, it's just an aside that the earliest, if you go back 100 years to the beginning of neural tissue culture, they used to be what we would now call, maybe not even organoids, they used to be called organotypic cultures or explant cultures that were put in uh, hanging drops and maximal slides and roller tubes for exactly the reasons that you found your primary tissue so valuable and that in a way we're trying to re-emulate. With the organoids, we're trying to recreate what the neurobiologists did 100 years ago, but with the modern day tools that they did not have. So it, uh, it is interesting. You, you've brought back, I think, how important it is to be aware of, your, of the roots of our science. Another question is, uh, do chimps get macrocephaly? And I guess the flip side of that is, do chimps get microcephaly? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm not, I, yeah, I don't see why not. I'm, 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 you know, I'm not aware of any studies on the pathology, you know, brain pathology in, in chimps. Um, you know, it would be difficult to study, uh, of course. Uh, there aren't many examples. Uh, you know, most of the individuals in zoos and, uh, you know, uh, are, are being returned now. So uh, it's very difficult, especially now, to study uh, brain development in chimpanzees, as I've sort of highlighted. Um, the only person I'm aware of who actually has some fetal chimpanzee specimens in a freezer is Nanad Sistan at Yale. Um, and he was able to obtain those in quite some time ago, so he's now uh, doing single nuclear sequencing to look more carefully at the molecular expression in different cell types at the ages that he has. So I'm very anxious to see that data when it, when it comes out. Um, but otherwise, I think it'll be very difficult uh, to do any kind of chimpanzee study uh, looking at prenatal stages. Well, most of the questions that are coming in now are mostly uh, complimenting you on how exciting and interesting your work is. <laughs> but in, embedded in one of these compliments is a question as well. Uh, could you please briefly review the role of some jumping prior to division in ORGs and yeah. the implication and their implication for disease? Yeah, that, that's a very interesting question. We've been uh, struggling, as it were, with that for some time. Um, it's a very unique behavior. And as I mentioned, it's only these outer radioglia that have been described to behave that way. In mouse, uh, we found ORG-like cells um, that also jump and divide. Uh, there are very few of them. They are the mouse version of an outer radioglial cell. And they express some of the same, but not all the same markers. And as I mentioned, dynamically, they, they also jump and divide, but they jump a very short distance. Whereas the human cells will jump 100 microns in an hour, the mouse cells will jump 10 or 15 microns, a much smaller jump. Um, so they're similar, but not exactly the same. So I think the outer radio glial cells are certainly not primate specific. They're present, uh, we think, in all mammal brain. They were there very early on in development, in evolution, I should say. Uh, but they've been highly enriched in large brain mammals, including, of course, primates and human. Um, uh, right. So I'm sorry. The question was. <laughs> oh no, no. The question was, uh, and, I, and I think you answered it uh, as to whether uh, there's any, are, are there any implications for disease? Oh, right. I'm sorry. The implications, right? Of course. So uh, when we <clears throat> when we first uh, observed that they are all jumping and dividing in this outer subventricular zone, we um, we wondered if that might account for the big expansion in that zone that I showed you early on. 
And uh, we took cortical slices and we were able to, I didn't talk about this, but we looked at the, a study uh, that was published some time ago. We looked at the motors that drive the MST jump. And we assumed it would be microtubule motors. Uh, it turned out it wasn't, it, it was uh, actomyosin in fact. So we used blebostatin to inhibit the actomyosin. We could prevent the jumps altogether, but the cells were still able to divide because the microtubules and the spindles were, were, uh, were intact. So we treated our cortical slices either with blebostatin or not and cultured them for a period of a week and then uh, fixed and stained and looked at their architecture. And exactly as you'd predict, uh, the cells that were treated with blebostatin where the outer radio V were unable to jump and divide, uh, the outer subventricular zone was really very small. Whereas in the control culture, that uh, outer radio V zone had expanded you know, quite a bit from uh, during that seven day interval. And so um, you know, we concluded that one of the roles of the jump was that it helped expand the, zone, the outer subventricular zone. Uh, but that's not a clean experiment because as many of you probably know, uh, it turns out that the uh, actomycin pathway is important for neuronal migration. So uh, presumably we're also preventing neurons from migrating. So whether that played a role or not uh, is hard to say, but, uh, but that's the one piece of evidence we have about the role uh, that this might play. It might have to do with the expansion of that progenitor zone. What does it mean in terms of disease? You know, we're not sure. Um, it would mean that the cells that are being um, born from these outer radioglia uh, will be born in a different location than they normally would. Uh, that is, if the cells don't jump, uh, they will divide and produce their daughter cells in a zone that's much closer to the ventricle than would normally occur. And it may be that the reason they're jumping and dividing, and this is a teleological explanation for which I have no evidence, is that it deposits the daughter cells closer to their eventual target, which is you know the cortical layer that they're migrating to. As the brain expands, it gets really very, very big. And if the cells had to migrate from the ventricle all the way to the cortical surface, that could take a very long time and be a very long uh, distance. Whereas in, because of these jumping, dividing behaviors, the cells are actually being born halfway to the target already. So they have a shorter distance to travel. Now, I don't know whether that's why it happens, but, um, but that may be a consequence of the behavior itself that the daughter cells are born in a different layer, one that's closer to their eventual target. And I think you've also, you've already addressed that you think the mechanism or the motor for the jump is actin myosin. Yes. The microtubular yes. cytoskeleton. Yeah, I, you know, I, I, I should maybe include this slide because it, it's, it's a lesson for me as well as for everyone else. Um, when my postdoc first approached that problem and wanted to study it, I said, well, you know, let's use nicotazole. It'll disaggregate microtubules and it'll block the jump. So the first thing she did is she added nicotazole to her um, ORG cells and uh, came back a day later with these films that showed me to be entirely wrong. I mean, not only <laughs> didn't it, it did not block the jump, but as I mentioned, the jumps were bigger. They jumped almost twice as far. <laughs> so, you know, clearly this is not the answer for, you know, <clears throat> what was driving the jump. Um, and as I mentioned, eventually when she got to using blebostatin and other inhibitors of the uh, actomycin pathway, that's when the jump was blocked. So it was a very clear cut result, but it was the opposite of, or it was different than what I expected. Yeah. Well, that, that's interesting. And I know you have no data and this is purely speculative, but if in fact there are diseases where this actin-myosin mechanism is impaired, could that be, do you think, one way to tie what we've seen clinically, brain diseases that also have muscle diseases associated with them, or even cardiac diseases associated with them. Yeah, sure. I mean, these pathways are, you know, are conserved across different organs and different cell types. And if you have a systemic problem, a mutation or some genetic disease, um, it could easily have effects in the brain and the heart or, you know, muscle, as you mentioned. Yeah, sure. And, and we know there are these syndromes that, that clear, clearly exist in pediatric neurology. I guess the last question, and you probably have answered this already, but uh, do you, does any of the, this translocation occur in other species? Right. Um, so once, you know, before we even had markers for the ORG cells, <clears throat> that is before we did the single cell sequencing study, uh, we observed this behavior, the you know, MST behavior. So with only that as a tool, we started looking in other animals, different species, uh, to see if we could find cells that were jumping and dividing. Uh, 
And that's where we found the mouse cells that actually did jump and divide, although I, I mentioned they jumped much less. And uh, once we have markers now, people have gone and looked at multiple other species, beginning with the ferret and marmoset and uh, macaque. And so these ORG cells now have been found across almost all the mammals that people have looked at. Um, I'm aware of some studies that are being done in uh, cetaceans, you know, whales and porpoises. Um, it'd be interesting to see if uh, they can find these cells there. I predict they will. Um, so, uh, and I should mention, uh, in case any of you are uh, sort of mis misconstruing that these adorated glial cells uh, are what is responsible for cortical folding, because I gave you the example of lysencephaly where these cells are involved. Uh, many of the species that have lots of ORG cells have a lysencephalic cortex, smooth brain. Uh, some are highly folded like humans and uh, many primates, but there are also primates like the uh, um, uh, marmoset, which uh, has lots of ORG cells during early development, but has a smooth cortex. So the presence of these adorated glial cells is not enough, it, you know, maybe necessary, but it's not sufficient to produce cortical folding. Something else is involved in actually folding the cortex. Okay. And I guess you, you may have also addressed this as well. This is one last question, and we'll make this the last question. Uh, do you think the miller deeker defect in the jump size is connected to the same uh, nicotazole uh, mechanism? And if so, what is the connection to MT? Yeah, exactly. So, uh, you know, the uh, nicotazole experiment and that uh, study of the motor that drives the jump, you know, that was done, you know, many years before um, the lysencephaly organoid project. Um, and so we already knew that if you disaggregate microtubules, not only do the ORG cells jump further, but they get arrested in division. And that makes sense. You can't divide if you don't have microtubules. Um, so, so that phenotype of a bigger than normal jump and a problem with cell division, uh, we'd already observed and proved years ago was a, an effect of, of a microtubule dysfunction. So when we saw this phenotype in our organoids years later, the fact that the ORGs in miller deeker patients were jumping further and then arresting in division uh, you know, that immediately suggested, uh, you know, microtubule problem. And, uh, and of course, you know, the light bulb went off because uh, this one, the gene that is pre predominantly responsible for this encephaly, is known to be a microtubule um, associated protein. And, you know, when it's mutated, it causes a problem with microtubules. So that fit very nicely. Um, but the phenotype was one that we recognized because of the study we'd done some years earlier, uh, looking at the motors that drive the trunk. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll wind up here. This was this was fantastic, and uh, thanks Arnold, and thanks for everybody for uh, logging in. Thanks so much, Arnold, and thanks everybody. Bye bye. Thanks, everyone.